Behind every amazing flavor is an amazing human who has perfected their craft. Welcome to Flavors Unknown. A behind the scenes look at new flavors and the chefs, pastry chefs, and bartenders who create them with your host, Emmanuel. On today's show, meet the executive pastry chef, Mark Welker, from Eleven Madison Park and the restaurant Nomad. Have you ever wanted to hear what goes on behind the scene of one of the best restaurants in the world? Stick around. I am your host, Emmanuel LaRoche, and welcome to Flavors Unknown podcast. If you are new to the show, I have been in the food industry for more than 20 years, both in Europe and in the US, and every other week I interview trending chef, pastry chef, and bartenders to discover their creative process share with you exciting locations, and find out what new flavors they are experimenting with. Last week, my guest was the James Beard Award-winning chef Chris Shefford from Houston, Texas. On that episode, chef Chris Shefford explained that local for him means a lot more than the source of ingredients and their geographical proximity to your plate. The podcast website is flavorsunknown.com. Make sure to listen and subscribe to the show and please share it with other chefs and foodie friends. Hi, Chef. How are you? I'm doing well. Thank you. Welcome to the show Flavors Unknown. Yeah, thank you for having me. You're welcome. I'm very excited to have you uh, on the podcast. We have been trying for, uh, for a while and yeah, uh, you yeah. are, you're really busy. <laughs> you're a busy guy. And I'm traveling quite a bit as well. So I look at your, um, you know, of your career and... Uh, It's interesting because you have been, um, you know, in different places. Obviously, you were raised in Indiana. Then you went to Culinary Institute, what was the culinary, French Culinary Institute, or the Culinary School, sorry, in Kentucky. And then you attended the former French Culinary Institute in New York City. Yes. And then you decided to uh, go to France. And I'm quoting you. You said because you wanted to understand where pastry making was born. I think that just stemmed from being young. Like I, I went to culinary school when I was 18 years old and, you know, you romanticize about, you know, France and French pastries and where cuisine, you know, yeah, where, where, where it came from or where it was originally refined, if you will. And so, so it's always been a life, lifelong goal. Like I, I always thought that it was one of those steps that you needed to take to be successful. Like one of those things like going into fine dining, like how you get to that three Michelin star level and there's a path to get to that level. And to me, that was just something that, that I needed to do. How was the experience? The experience was great. Like I, I realized a few things. I think um, one, that um, there wasn't that much difference in what the French were doing as opposed to what I was doing. Culturally, it was much different because I worked in a small patisserie and, and Bézier. And, you know, we would, the volume was so much different. Like people would come to the, the patisserie for breakfast, they would come in the afternoon, and then they would come in the evening before they went to their friend's house for dinner to pick up some canapes or, you know, some petit fours or a cake or whatever it may be. So culturally, it was much different. And it allowed me to, to work in an environment where the volume was high. And we're still doing these like kind of classic modern French pastries. And that was a really good experience just to do that. But I think more just personally living in another country is something that I think that everybody should do, you know, in their life. So do you still recommend today for young pastry chef or young, I would say, chef to have an experience? Does it have to be in France, but let's say, you know, abroad? And I think travel is very important. I think, you know, I think people should travel. I think everybody should travel, especially Americans. I think it's good to get out of, of the country and kind of see how small the world is and kind of how small yeah, life is. And, and, and it kind of makes you realize things differently and, and you think differently. And I think that's all important to get you out of your shell and You know, I think I was at a point in my career where I've already been cooking at that point for, including culinary school for like eight years, five, yeah, I was like six, eight years, something. And so like I had a decent background already before I did that. It wasn't like I was like soul searching or anything like that. It was a very planned, executed thing. I think it was a stepping stone in my career and I was focused that whole time on my career still. It wasn't like I was trying to figure out where vanilla beans are, are, are from and like really just kind of. I wasn't like lost, you know, I was so very focused. I think I recommend it for people who want to enhance their career and just become a better person. You know, I think traveling and, and working other places and 
especially places where you don't speak the language fluently. Like I, I struggled with, with French and I took a lot of lessons beforehand, yeah. but and probably was, no one helped you. Was, with it. <laughs> <laughs> they're actually pretty nice. I mean, the, okay. the people in the bigger cities could be a little, little mean, um, <laughs> make fun of your accent. And a lot of times you just meet people that wanted to try their English out on you. So they're just as excited to be speaking English as I was French. And for the most part, it was great, you know? So, so yes, I, I, I recommend it, but I think there's a time and the place. I, I see a lot of young cooks, who are searching for something that I don't think they're ever really going to find by traveling, you know? What do you mean by that? What are they searching for? I don't know. I, I just don't. I, I think that the, the, path, the path to success was much different when I was younger to what I think it is for the younger generation of cooks that it is now. I think they realize that I think a lot of it is the wealth of information online. I think it's all the periodicals. It's, it's social media. You can learn how to make, you know, like a mirror glaze for an entremet online you know you don't you don't have to go work at a place for a year to to get their recipes you know and like when i was young that was my min- mindset was i need to go stage i need to work and i need to stay at that place for like two years and i'm going to learn everything that i can from that place and i just don't think people have that same mentality they want to they want to learn things much faster than what it was they want to move through the stations a lot quicker and it's more about resume building and to them I've never really cared about a resume because I, I was just always, you know, focused on myself and my career, not necessarily just a name on my resume or to say that I staged at a place. I staged at a place because I wanted to learn a technique. Yeah, because what I've seen and discussed with other chefs, it seems to be that the stage now it's really to have, like, as you said, like names on your resumes and the experience and like the, the reference that, yes. um, you know, other people can uh, relate to. You said that uh, an experience abroad, you still you know, advice, you know, to, to do it and, and to travel. So for your point of view, with everything that's happening around the world, uh, where should they go? Because it doesn't have to be France, you know, anymore. So wh- where do you think is like the, the hot spot at the moment? I've always been better at speaking Spanish than, than French, you know. So I, I think I would have gotten more out of the experience had I went to a place where I could speak the language better. France was just, I wanted to do France, you know, and, and that was kind of it. I was also dating a girl at the time who was getting her PhD in French. And so like I was really drawn I was really drawn to French cuisine and, and French wine and, and just French culture, the the way the French eat and kind of the lifestyle of that. That's what I was drawn to and that's that's really about, in the end why I chose that. But I would recommend a place where you can get the most information out of it and then like really kind of like have some goals. You know, I think that setting goals is really important when you're young and, and when you're you're striving to to start your career and kind of figure out where you you exist in the world of cooking. And so it's like set goals and figure out which place is going to help you reach those goals. You know, because if it's just a vacation, you know, then it's it's just a vacation, you know, and it, you're not really going to gain much out of it except for the experience of traveling. It's still important. There's like strategic you know, locations or countries for pastries yeah, nowadays? Yeah, I think now, I, you know, I think there's so many, especially with the, with the 50 best out there, they highlight so many different restaurants from all over the world. And so many of these restaurants have different philosophies. So like, you know, if, if you know, fermentation and, and foraging and things like that, like, you know, there's restaurants out there that specialize in that. Like, you know, a lot of the Nordic restaurants, I think some of the restaurants in Brazil and South America really do well with that. If you're interested in, in Mexican cuisine and Mexican spice and things like that, then you should probably travel south of the border. But I think that there's restaurants all over the world at this point in time. And I don't even think it needs to be a Michelin star restaurant. Like if, if you're passionate about Thai food and you want to learn about Thai ingredients, then just go travel through Thailand. Go, go, eat, go eat on the streets, go eat at the hawker stalls, go to the markets, go to the wet markets, have an Airbnb, get the ingredients, cook. You know, and, and I think that there's, there's other ways also, and it just depends on what you're into. But I think as long as you're setting yourself goals and pushing to meet those goals, and then with a mindset of coming back and actually using the things that you've learned to better yourself and to further your career and not just have it be like, you know, kind of a, and there's with no timelines, you know, and no, no end goal. So setting goals seems to be very important for you, correct? The way how you progress and you evolve uh, through your career, that's what you have done at a young age, because France, France was already part of, you know, some of the goal setting. Yeah. I, I mean, I remember when, when I was like 19 years old, going, going to France and living in France was a long term goal of mine. You know, I think long-term goals change as you change and as you grow as, as an adult. And 
but short-term goals are things that I think that should be realistic. And I think that you should have a lot of them. And I think that you should be checking those goals off. And, and it feels really good when you see a list of goals that you had and, and you check them off. And so every year you are setting some exactly, yeah, personal goal. Think, yeah. Anything that you can share? Some, even that you have accomplished. I mean, yeah, I, I find myself in this situation now, like I've gotten to a point in my career where there aren't so many goals. I think my goals now are collective and, and of one mindset with our company and with Chef Hoom and where we see our company going into the future. Those are kind of where my goals align now. Like they're not so personal anymore. I think personally, my goals are to help other people reach their goals, to help the younger cooks and, and the pastry chefs and, and other people kind of find their own, their own path, their own correct path. And, and I want to see other people kind of do, do what I did maybe a little bit differently, but I can always, you know, give them advice from, from my experiences with that. So you were talking about name on, you know, on the resume. So this is not what you wear after, but it happens yeah. that you had very soon after you came back, you know, from France, you apply for a job at Eleven Medicines. Uh, yes. Park, correct. I mean, so, so that's a huge name on the resume. Yeah, it's a huge name. There's actually a, a small mix of time in between there. I, I came back in late 2008. Actually, right after culinary school, I lived in St. Louis for four years. So I was in St. Louis. So I had a good, strong connection with friends and people um, in the restaurant industry there that I knew. When I came back from New or from France, I came back to New York and I staged at WD50. Oh, uh, yeah. Sure. And I was working with um, Alex Dupac and Rocio Sanchez um, and Wiley and, and the whole gang over there. I was there for like eight, six weeks. So it wasn't long. It was unpaid. And I kind of decided in France, I was actually supposed to stay in France for a year. I cut my trip short by nine months because I realized I was just living in France and I wasn't progressing anymore. Like, so I kind of hit a wall and I was just like, it's time to go, you know, and, and, and what Alex was doing at WD50 was something I've never seen before. I was really inspired by that. And so I decided to make it audible and I, I came back to New York and, and got a trail at WD50. And again, that was another life changing experience in my career that really opened opened my mind to um, different techniques and, and things that I hadn't seen. And even if there are techniques that I don't really want to use now or that are applicable now, I think it's good to understand that that was a very important time in the culinary world. And my best friends in St. Louis, they bought an existing business, which is just a, a coffee shop, a small cafe, serve breakfast and lunch. And they didn't really know what they're doing as far as like running the kitchen and setting it up. And so I moved back to St. Louis for like three months and just helped them open a coffee shop and, and learn coffee shop recipes and, and give them a good foundation that they could kind of take and run with it. And um, it's still existing business yeah. now. They've been open for over 10 years and it's very successful and it's really cool to see. And then during that time, once like we treated like he's a good friend of mine and I knew it couldn't be open ended, I need to be paid for my time there. It wasn't like a charity thing. So we kind of set some strict guidelines uh, about me being there. I was actually living with them, too. So we had some deadlines. We, we reached everything. We reached our goals. And then I had some spare time to kind of put my resume together and start reaching out. And I want, knew I wanted to come to New York and I knew I wanted to work at 11 Madison Park. So I set up a three day trail. So I, I came and staged for three oh, days. Okay. And it was, it was basically my interview and I didn't even have set up another trail because I was dead set on, on working at 11 Madison Park. And was it a three Michelin star already at that time? No, it, no, was, it was not. It was no Michelin star at no that Michelin time. Star. Yeah, it was a three star New York Times review restaurant. So you have been there? F been there for over 10 years. Yeah. So yeah, it was April in 2009 is when I started. Yeah. And I, w I was so arrogant at that time too. I remember when I first was coming on board, I went to their website and Angela Pinkerton was the pastry chef there, but it wasn't listed on the website. You know, Chef Whom has went through a long period of time of notoriously not necessarily getting along with pastry chefs. And uh, so she was under the title of executive pastry sous chef. And I saw that and I was like, oh, they don't have a pastry chef. I was like, I really, I, maybe I can get that in that position. <laughs> That was my mindset. And, you know, even to this day, and that's actually something that Danny Meyer, and that, that was back when there was, it was a Danny restaurant. And Danny Meyer always used to say, I want to hire people who want my job, you know? And I still agree with that today. I think that when we, when we hire people, we want people that are ambitious. We want people that want to be chefs. I want to be executive chefs. I want to be like, I want to be the chef of this restaurant. And I think that's great. And I, I had that mentality, you know, not knowing. And I think, you know, going there was a big wake up call. I, you know, it was humbling. I realized that I wasn't as good as I thought I was. There was still a lot of refining 
for myself to do. It was great working under Angela. She was a great, you know, leader of that team. And yeah, so I, I learned a lot in that time and that, that, that first few years of here in New York. And what drove me to New York as well was, was working for a large team, you know, working in restaurants in St. Louis and Louisville, Kentucky and things like that. It's very small teams and you're very lucky if there is a pastry chef. And I, in St. Louis, I was, I was technically the pastry chef of a small French restaurant when I got there. But I was also in doing the garmage and the pantry section, doing all the charcuterie, the pâtés, the smoked salmon. And then our chef opened up a restaurant next door to that. So I was doing the desserts for there as well. And I, I don't think that that's kind of uncommon in those smaller cities. And I wanted to work on a team that was more collaborative and that was bigger and that you could like learn from. You could grow as a leader in that team. You know, at the beginning, so you were not yet as a mentor or a leader and then so you guys got like the three michelin stars so three michelin stars actually came it came much later it came quite a few years later when i started at 11 madison park it was a four-star mantra is what we had we wanted to be a four-star new york times restaurant we didn't even care about michelin at that time we didn't even know what the san pellegrino 50 best list was (laughs) so it it was great because it was like a tangible goal and when i first got there I don't think Frank Bruni, Frank Bruni was a critic at the time. I don't think he had come in for his first visit yet, but we, we had the mantra every day was we want to be four star restaurant. And you could question things. If, if you're canelling ice cream on the dessert and there's a big hole in the back of it, you could, you could physically look at it and ask yourself, is that a four star canel? Is that a four star scoop of ice cream? And the answer was very clear. You know, if it has a big hole in it, no, it's not because a four star to us meant it was perfect. Is the texture of the ice cream there? Spinning ice creams every day, you know, like just just the mise en place and making sure everything is fresh and perfect, and and that was the mantra. And then Frank Bruni started coming in, and we knew we were going to get reviewed, and it just got really, really intense. And that was also at a time when the 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 financial market was going down here in New York, and you know we weren't a busy restaurant. You know, we would do maybe twenty covers on on a Tuesday. And then we do 250 covers on a Saturday and it was so polarizing and you just <laughs> you get your butt kicked on the weekends because um, we had a tasting menu also, plus these a la carte prefix menus and you do 50 tasting menus and it was just, you were just in the weeds constantly. It was, it was a big push. But we how, how do you handle the pressure? I mean, I was a cook at that time, so I just did what I was told and worked as hard as I could and try to work as quickly as I could and paid attention and, and that worked, you know, and. Yeah, we, we got four stars. And when we got four stars in August of 2009, everything changed, you know, and that, that was when our books were consistently busy. We became a busy restaurant. And when you have customers in your seats, when you have guests sitting down and paying, you have revenue coming in. And then you're not so worried about payroll isn't as important, you know, food costs isn't as important because you have so much revenue coming in. And it really kind of changed the way that we focused on the restaurant. We became a four star restaurant. We had a time to grow into being a four star restaurant. And then to be honest, I don't I don't know the timeline when Michelin came in. Like we got snubbed a couple of times and I think a couple of years. And then eventually we were a one star Michelin restaurant. We we're like, you know, it's crazy that we're a one star restaurant, but we're four New York Times stars. We knew that we we're better than that. And I don't even know if we went from one to two. I think we just went from one to three. I guess that was we hit three, was it it may have been twelve, two thousand twelve or thirteen, I think is when we hit three stars. So you said that the first step was those four New York, you know, star, and then, and then now the three star Michelin's in your mindset, you and the rest, you know, the team, is it different? Is it like a different level? Is it like no, I don't internally, so. or is it more for like the outsiders, the people, you know, that, um, that are, that you know, coming to the restaurant? To me, the restaurant didn't, and, and granted, like I, I've worked for this company for, for 10 years, but I wasn't always at 11 Madison. I came here to the Nomad in late 2011 to open as a pastry chef. And I didn't end up going back to 11 Madison in my current role now until 2015. So there was three years there where I wasn't so involved with everything there. Like I was still in the inner circle of chefs and, and, and of our of our team. There's a lot that happened. And, and the San Pellegrino list was probably once we started with that was when most of the changes really started to happen. I remember the first year we were on the San Pellegrino list, we were number 50. And I know I had no idea what the San Pellegrino list was. All of a sudden, there's this list out there of best restaurants, and there's 50 of them. And we were number 50. And we were like, wow, we're 50, so we're last. You know, it's like, (laughs) we don't want to be last at anything. We want to be first. So that's when we started saying we want to be the best restaurant in the world. 
that drive really kind of at our growth on, on the San Pellegrino list, I think it kind of opened the doors globally for us as well. We started seeing a lot more cooks from Europe, South America, even India, mm-hmm. Korea, like all these people from all over were trying to come and work with us. But what does that mean practically? I mean, for the people who are listening said, we want to be first on this list. So, okay, that's a statement. That's a goal. Now, yeah. how do you put, you know, those steps and initiatives in order to reach that goal yeah. practically? Luckily for us, we had great leadership at the time. You know, um, this was back, you know, when Will Gadara was with us as well. But Chef Hume and Will at that time, they really went out and they sold the company. You know, they're out promoting the company. They're traveling. They're doing the, the San Pellegrino events, going to the things, networking, I think is really important with that. So it's good that we had the leadership at the top of the company that was out there selling the company, selling the restaurant, not selling it, but, you know, putting our names out there and like and, and, and networking to a point where people are starting to know who we are and people are starting to come. And when they come to New York, these people that are voters and these people part of the San Pellegrino list were coming to our restaurant and eating. And that's where us here on the ground was putting in all the hard work of making all this stuff happen, you know, making that restaurant the best it possibly could be and just focusing on each day, you know, each day for us, we always say each day is the Super Bowl, you know, so every single day we show up to work, we need to think of it like a championship game. How do you ramp up and energize like the team when you say it's constant, like it's every day? How, how do you ramp up into like the service? It starts at the top, you know, it starts with the chef, you know, the chef of the restaurant has to be on, on point. He has to be on, on at his A game every day and every day he has to show up and it doesn't matter if, you know, he woke up and didn't feel well or if, you know, he woke up and didn't have hot water and he took to take a cold shower, like all that. As soon as you walk in that door, you take a deep breath and you're the chef, you know. No sick days, <laughs> <laughs> correct? Yeah. Wow. Wow, that's amazing. You know, I still believe that. You know, as a leader, you know, as a leader, you you have to, you have to you have to show up every day like like you're ready for the championship game, and and it starts at the top. How many people do you manage currently? Directly, so basically, each restaurant has a pastry chef, and then some of the smaller venues that we have, like uh, in Nomad Las Vegas, it's a very small department, so we just have a pastry chef. I don't have a sous chef there, but I basically just manage the pastry chefs. I, I do speak with the sous chefs, and we have like meetings with the sous chef team as well. But it's more direct management to the pastry So chef, between so. Eleven Madison Park, so Mass Park the Nomad two, York, Nomad the three LA, now, yeah, LA, and, and then in London, probably two. Yeah. Okay. So uh, what's the, the size of the team here? Fully staffed at Eleven Madison Park, we have around 18 to 20 people in pastry, including one pastry chef and then two sous chefs there. It's the same here in Nomad New York. We have one pastry chef, two sous chefs, and then a slightly smaller team of cooks, which probably around 13 cooks from there. Which is still pretty. Okay, large you're team. talking about like what, 40, 45 people? Something like this? Yeah. Yeah, I'd okay. say about 45 people total. Yeah, yeah. In the that's pretty department. decent. Yeah. So, what's your leadership style? Um, you know, to be honest, it's, it's, it's very collaborative department. I think when, as a team, like when we, when we talk about things that we want to accomplish, you know, everyone's voice, you know, counts and everyone's voice matters. But I just want to, I want people to be the best versions of themselves, you know, and I, I think just kind of helping them get there, helping them make good decisions. It's a little more, it's not so, it's not so hands-on in the restaurants, you know, driving the team. Like I want the pastry chefs to be doing that on a daily basis. You know, I can, if I'm there doing that every day, it kind of takes away from, from their role. What kind of tone and language, I mean, do you use, you know, to manage those that team well i'll say i've i've grown up a lot and i've i've changed i think the times have changed that when i first started i was um i was a little more hot tempered yeah more fiery hey you spend time in france too so you remember <laughs> yeah those, guys, <laughs> those french chef in the, ki- in the kitchen they like to yell over there um yeah there's there's a lot of yelling you know there's you know yeah you look back and you're like oh maybe i you know i didn't treat some people so nicely you know, now I think we manage, we try to manage a little bit more with, uh, with kindness and positivity. I think, I think especially with, you know, you, these young, younger chefs, I think that it, you get more out of them that way. I know when I first started, I wanted to be in those intense environments. Like I knew that if I was getting yelled at, I knew, I knew I messed something up and I knew that I wouldn't do it again. And like, I was like, 
okay, I, I learned my lesson. I'm like, thank you for yelling at me, you know, and it just doesn't work that way here. So I think, you know, making sure that people have a voice, mentoring, coaching, you know, and yeah, and, and with positive reinforcement, I, th- I think goes a long way. Everyone wants to be led. Everyone needs leadership. Everyone wants to learn, you know, and I think we just really try to create an environment where we can lead. It's everything is a learning opportunity. Even if you mess up, like we try to learn from it. We let people know when things are very important and that there's no room for error. So I think that all that comes into play with. Okay. So constant are, feedback. Yeah, I con- guess. Constant feedback, just being there, you know, and, and making sure that your door is always open so that there are problems. You know, it's not like someone is, is nervous to come talk to you about it. Like I want everyone to, to be very open and honest and transparent with the reality of each situation each day and like things that are messed up. Like, let's just talk about it and we'll, we'll fix it together, you know. So when you are looking for someone new to join the team and you have to hire someone, yeah. what are you looking in terms of qualities? What are you looking into this uh, new person? Yeah, I, I think the, the most important thing is that they're a nice person. I think, you know, obviously you're, you're going to be surrounded by this person for a long time. And I think it's different at each level, whether or not you're applying for a sous chef. We actually try not to hire sous chefs or any management position from the outside. They grow in within. Yeah, so so we pretty much only hire from within. It's not not a hundred percent, you know. We'll say, but but that is the, the the goal. But we want people that we want to work with for a long time. It's like I said before, we want people that I want to hire someone that wants my job. You know, I want ambitious people. But I know it can't with with the team as big of ours. You know, you can't have everybody like that. You know, so it, it's a good balance. So depending on on the skill sets of the whole team. You know, you only have enough room for so many green people on your team. You need some experienced people. You need some middle of the road people. What's usually the turnover of, I'm not so talking about the green one, but the, the people that have already have, a, you know, like an experience within the, the company. But also what's different now from, from back when I was a cook is turnover is much higher. You know, like it, it, it's not as frequently that we get people to work two, three years as a cook. People are like, you know, I, you know, there's, I know for sure I'm not going to be a sous chef in the next year and a half, blah, blah, blah. Like they move on. So turnover is a thing and, you know, it's a struggle, but. Do they want, do you think that new generation wants to um, uh, reach their goals like quicker, faster? I don't know. To be honest, I, I don't know what their goals are. I mean, I think that that's, that's part of like who we hire, make sure that we are hiring like people that are trying to set goals. We talk about goals um, with the team and stuff like that, make sure they're hitting their goals. Because also if you don't know someone's goals, it's hard to manage them. Sure. So I think understanding where someone wants to be, it's like, like, what do you want? Do you want to be a sous chef? Do you want to just learn bread? Like is, is mastering like tempering chocolate or like making entremets? Like what is it that like really drives you? And then, you know, you can, you can find moments in the day where you can like teach people something like that, or you can like take them, take them one-on-one and, and kind of show them a task. Or if you're making a cake, you can, you know, show them technique or ha- help them, have them help glaze the cake or something like that. And it kind of takes you pretty far. So another aspect that uh, I'm interested in, if you would take Nomad, uh, you know, as a group and as a brand. And then you have obviously different locations here, one in New York, one in LA, one in, in Las Vegas, and then now one in London. So how do you look at creating a menu which still resonates with the brand, yeah. but I'm guessing is as well different because the customers in LA are not the same than one in New York and in London, obviously. To be honest, we learned the hard way with that. I think when we, well, LA was our first nomad outside of New York City. New York City was obviously very successful. We felt like it was a very strong brand and we tried to carbon copy it in Los Angeles. It didn't work so well. I, I don't think that people in LA needed this restaurant and especially in downtown at that time. And so that we, we, we had to adjust, you know, and we had to make changes and we made those changes pretty quickly. And I think we learned that in each, you know, location that it's a different market and there's different people and, and there's different things and there's different like expectations of how, how they're going to eat and how they're going to go out and dine and, and so forth. So we started to allow Los Angeles to kind of become a Los Angeles restaurant, you know, and, and what that meant was, paying more attention to what's at the market, using the ingredients, understanding the cultures and the way that people are eating are so much different than they are here in New York. 
So how do you do this? You do um, tasting yeah, well, again, track? You do, yeah, so we um, do tastings. We do a lot of research. We go out to eat a lot um, in those places. But I think it's most important is we listen to the chefs that are on the ground working there. You know, by, by the time we started to realize we needed to make some changes to our menu in Los Angeles, our chefs that transplanted themselves out there had been there for over a year. And so through the pre-opening and opening with that, you know, they've been there long enough. And, and a lot of our chefs also are from Los Angeles out there. And so it was just it was a lot of it was just like listening to them and kind of going from there and just trying new things. Trial and error. So each of the team are creating, I guess, then their menus, correct? Everyone contributes. It's, it's, yeah, it's very collaborative. So what we do, like at our level, and my level, and like our R&D chefs, you know, we'll put together like a, a, a menu with just like a list of ingredients, you know, could say like, you know, strawberries are going to be coming in season. Like, let's think about strawberries, you know? And so like right now, uh, we're in the middle of winter, like we just changed our menu to 11 Madison Park. But even here in at Nomad, New York, it's, it's time to start thinking about spring food. And so, yeah. And then we just think about what ingredients are there. In Los Angeles, you have spring comes much earlier, you know, strawberries, you get strawberries year round. So if you really want to and good strawberries too. So you, you can keep those on the menu in January and February. They're, they're around. But yeah, we, we try to keep it seasonal and we kind of kind of put those feelers out there. And then we, we schedule tastings, you know. The menu doesn't need to change as frequently out there, I think, as it does here. Can you take us through, you know, the, the approach when you are creating like a, a new menu, if it's, uh, you know, for 11 Medicine Park or for, or for Nomad? What are like the steps? Where, where do you start? What's the source of inspiration? So I heard the seasonality obviously seems, you know, an important factor. But what's your first step? First step would be picking an ingredient that we want to showcase. And then then going through like a, a list of kind of what, what you want. And I mean, this is very, very vague, but, you know, you, you think strawberries and what goes well with strawberries? What can I do to a strawberry? You know, what, what things can I make with a strawberry that will be good? And just like really kind of open and fluid. And then you kind of have an idea, like if you want to, you know, make a riff off, you know, strawberry shortcake or something here, are the desserts at Nomad, they're a little bit more like nostalgic American or like rooted in, in ideas of like classic French pastries. But then we kind of make our own spin on it. Um, not like deconstructed to the point, but it's inspired from those things. Whereas the Love of Madison Park, it's a little bit more just ingredient focused, not necessarily like concept focused. So there it's, it, it's, it's about the ingredient. And then I think the first step is just once you have that and once you have like a list of uh, like a number of components that you've been working on is just to put it on the plate. And I think that's the hardest step is that first time that you plate the dish because, you know, it's not going to be great. It's not going to be perfect. I, I don't know one dish that, you know. How many iteration do you do? <laughs> in average, so you many. Know? I, I, so I don't many. even know. Like it can go on for weeks, you know. Yeah. And, and to see how these dishes evolve. And, you know, sometimes the dish doesn't even get on the menu. Sometimes you work on a dish for like three, four months. And then guess what? Spring is here, you know, and then you need a dish to go on the menu. If that dish isn't ready, you know, it's not going to be ready and the menu is going to change. Then you need to pull a dish from a year before, but that doesn't mean you give up on that dish. You, you have two choices. You can either shelve it and pick it up next year, save your notes uh, where you left off. We take good notes on everything that we do, or you can continue to work on it and then maybe change it a couple weeks later, or just work on it a little bit more. And then, then you're good and you kind of save it for the next year. So the, the creative aspect, creative aspect, sorry, is important, but I'm, I'm guessing when it comes to pastry, bakery, the techniques are really fundamental, yeah. correct? So there's no way that you can create an outside of the box if you don't master your technique first. It, it's very hard. I think those out of the box techniques that you do happen to develop is almost by chance or by accident. I think rarely do you think like, oh, I'm, you're, you're, you're that smart where you can like put together how these ingredients are going to work together and, and understand that you can just mix them blindly and you're going to have like this result. A lot of my best work too comes like after we pick the ingredient, after we do that, it's once we start plating, once you start seeing the food on the plate and you get past like that anxiety of like, oh, I'm going to put it on the plate and now I've got like 10 sous chefs plus chef whom that are sitting here critiquing it. You get used to that, you know, and as a new sous chef, that that's very nerve wracking experience to go through. And it's hard. That's why that first step is so hard. I've been doing it long enough that like I can take it, you know, like I, you, people can critique the food. You don't need to get too defensive about it. You just kind of roll with the punches and you keep going. And then through through that, just like through working on food, through plating it, doing it over and over and over again, 
you start to really understand the techniques that you're doing and, and how they change. And sometimes it's an accident. Sometimes it's just through small little incremental changes that help you get to a place where you've kind of developed a new recipe for something. And do you feel that this plating is even more important now with the technology and everyone taking their phone and taking a, like a picture on in, and putting on Instagram? Does it impact your way of concepting like um, like a, a new dessert I, and the plating aspect? Yes and no. I, I think at first, when you first start working on food, you, you take inspiration from what other people are doing and you almost try, you work within your comfort zone. So... You know, for example, if I left 11 Madison Park right now and went to go work for a different restaurant group of the same caliber, it would be very hard for me to get out of the style of desserts that I make now for 11 Madison Park. I think I would default to that because that's what's comfortable. And I think that's what younger chefs do is you default to what you're comfortable with. And it takes a long time before you understand your style or the style of the restaurant that you're, you're creating desserts for. Okay. So how would you describe that specific, I would say, signature plating for 11 Medicine Park? Minimal at this point in time. Like we want things to look effortless um, on the plate. But once you eat it, you realize that the, the flavors and the textures and the technique is much deeper than what you think. We want someone to look at it and be like, this is beautiful, but it looks effortless. It looks so simple, minimal on the plate. And then, yeah, when you go into it, you're like, this is not as simple as it seems. I think I, I like that with everything. Even even now here at the Nomad, when, when we create new desserts, we kind of want that same level of feeling. We don't want things to feel too fussy or to feel like there's so many components on the plate. You know, when I first started at 11 Madison Park, there's each dish had maybe 13 components on the plate. Like you almost need like two people tweezering like all these little micro herbs and hydrated basil seeds and fluid gels and dehydrated tweels and all this like stuff, you know. And not the case anymore. Not the case anymore, no. Streamline. Okay. <laughs> so is it as well because of not only the visual aspect, so the idea of minimalist from a visual standpoint and a constant standpoint, but as well from a logistics standpoint? No, I don't think it has anything to do with logistics because I don't think any of this is any easier. In fact, I think it's actually harder to work this level. When things are that minimal on the plate, it has to be perfect. Like if, if there's... There's like, if it's just like one kind of looks like one thing on the plate, it just needs to look perfect. So when, if we take one of the, your signature dessert at the Nomad, which is the milk and honey, was it based as well with this concept of minimalists or not, not yet? Not yet. It was not I, a, no, I don't think so. I don't think we were even there quite yet at 11 Madison Park. I think that really came and that came with, it came from Chef Whom, you know, and I think it came from us just at, collectively as a group becoming more confident in, in ourselves and, and, and with what we are doing. It, it was a big step for, I know for Chef Daniel, the first dish that we did at 11 Madison Park was the celery root and Vessi, the, the one in the, that's in the pig's bladder. Because that one on the plate is just, it's just a circular puree of celery root. And then there's a black truffle puree underneath. And then it's a sphere of celery root that's cooked in the pig's bladder and then glazed and then sauced with a little black truffle sauce. But it's just that on the plate. And that was the really first dish that he did at 11 Madison Park, that was like, that's it, you know, and there's nothing to hide behind like that. This, the celery ball has to be perfectly round. It also can't roll off the plate. It's got to stay right there. It's got to be hot. And there's just really nothing, nothing to hide behind. And then when you, when you do that, you're, you're vulnerable, you know, and you're vulnerable to people to critique it, to look at it and for them to pick up on flaws of that dish. Can you describe one of the, the desserts from the menu that is you know, connected to this uh, minimalist concept? I mean, it's kind of hard to describe without, without kind of seeing right now. Like one, one that I have in my mind right now is one we did a couple of summers ago was uh, warm peaches with creme fraiche. And you look at it, it was just a veil of, of peaches that look shingled on the plate in a circular pattern with almost like a Pac-Man kind of cut out of it. And then in that place was a canal of ice cream that was smashed and was white. And it was just like orange shingled peaches and a white scoop of ice cream. And just looking at it, it looks very, very simple. But then once you eat it, you realize there's so many layers going in there. Textures are different. There's things that are crunchy in there, soft in there. There's cheese components underneath. One is hot, one is cold. There's just a lot, a lot of steps to get that onto the plate. I think another one would be the cranberry dessert. I, actually, yeah, the cranberry, the, the desserts that we opened up with in, in 2017, our fall menu after the renovation, we had a cranberry dessert that was literally just spheres. Everything was like round on the plate. 
but each one was a different texture. It was between Parisian poached pears that are poached in a red wine to look like a cranberry, candied cranberries, cranberry ice cream that was you know, glazed and it kind of sat on a puree. And it just looks like all these little round balls. But that's one of the most time-consuming, labor-intensive desserts that we've, we've put on our menu. And then our apple donut. We have a, a donut, which is on the menu right now at Davies in Brook in London. And it looks just like a donut on the plate and a canal. But once you cut into the donut, you realize it's, it's an apple compote on the inside that we, we have frozen. And then we dip that into a, a beignet batter and, and fry it. It's not that easy. We don't even really let cooks assemble it because it, it, the more hands that touch it, it's just, you know, it just doesn't work. Personally, I have a hard time when I reach like the end of a meal and then I got served like something which is very sweet and I have a hard time with, you know, overly sweetened like dessert. How do you balance, you know, all the components of obviously sweetness, but as well bitterness, sourness, um, you know, even saltiness to give, you know, customers like a, a great experience at the end of a meal and not something which is going to be like, like almost too heavy. Yeah, I think it is the most difficult thing is, and it's all about balance. And I think that that's the hardest thing. I remember, when was it? It was this, uh, 2007 or 2006. I was, I was staging at uh, La Berta Den. I staged there for almost a, like I did every weekend for a full month. And Michael Asconis was there. And he always used to preach about, you know, using sugar like you would salt. And that always really stuck with me. And I think that that is something that's important. You should use sugar to season something, not to like just make it sweet, you know, not not just for like an end result. And I, I think that, yeah, that that is always stuck. I think the the use of acid um, in desserts and just in food in general is really important. I think the use of, we we talk about umami a lot, and I think it's it's a really big thing. But, you know, if something's a little salty, we think about how can we reduce like how, or if something's a little sweet, how can we reduce how sweet it is, especially if it's an ice cream, because the ice cream may be brixed. You know, exactly. To a certain sugar percentage. That's what I'm saying. It's, it's like still sometimes the sugar is part of the structure of the dessert. So things that we may do. To limit it. We did a black sesame dessert with lemon, and lemon desserts tend to be overly sweet as well. And it was kind of we're taking a riff off uh, lemon poppy, but instead of poppy, we're doing black sesame. And the dessert was eating kind of sweet, and acid wasn't really fixing it. And what helped us was adding miso to the ice cream and just adding that that le- other layers of flavor, you know and yeah, it just okay. works. And a lot of it is, is through experience. How do you come up with that? I don't think it's a new thing making miso ice cream. You know, I, I think actually Sam Mason, you yeah, know, yeah. Um, was, was known for doing uh, desserts and, and ice creams like that. Um, so it's been around for a long time. And I think it's just becoming more confident and, and being able to take those risks and to, to try things like that. It's like, oh, well, yeah, let's add miso to it and let, let's try it. And, you know, it's delicious. Miso and, miso and desserts is, is really, really good. Do you think that um, with your brand like Eleven Medicine Park or, you know, Nomad, that everything is allowed or there's things that you guys say sometime, even if someone come up with an idea and say like, ah, you know, maybe that's not for us. Um, we have multiple stages of, of menu development. The first one, we start with the cooks. Actually, we have at Eleven Madison Park what we call cook battles. So each cook is mandatory that they have to turn in a, a document of an idea for a dish a recipe, they have to draw a picture, they have to do all these things. And then we pick the winners. So I don't know, it could be like six winners out of the bunch. And then they get a certain number of hours that they're allowed to work on that dish. And then they present the dish to a panel. And then we grade the dish on our four fundamentals. So we have four fundamentals that we follow when it comes to working on food. The first is that it has to be delicious. I think that that's a given, like each, each dish that you have, it has to be good. It has to be beautiful. And to us at 11 Madison Park, the way that we define beauty is minimal. Like we want it to feel effortless on the plate and kind of natural, have like a natural organic kind of look to it. It has to have, uh, has to have a story. So it has to have intent is, is the, the third one. And sometimes the intention of a dish may overlook the ingredient or the creativeness. And the fourth one is creativity. So we have delicious beauty, intention, and, and creative. And it has to hit all those four levels. But sometimes one will overplay the other one. For example, the, the lemon poppy. We try to be very uh, New York local ingredients. And, and doing a dessert that is lemon-based, isn't, it isn't a New York ingredient. It is not something that you see around here. So it's not really something that we would do. 
but the intention of the dish kind of doing a play off of lemon poppy that turned into lemon sesame, that's kind of where that was able to kind of come on to the thing. So it isn't like anything is open. At the beginning, anything is open because we don't want to block creativity. We feel like the more guidelines, the more rules that you have, then the more you just get stuck in your own head and then you're afraid to even say something, you know, but we want people to not be afraid to say anything. And when you first put that thing on there, put whatever it is that you want on that plate, but understand that if the story and the intention of that dish isn't strong enough, maybe that ingredient that isn't local isn't going to work, you know, like we're not going to put a banana dish on the menu at 11 Madison Park, but maybe banana as an ingredient works into something that we're working on, you know, with a, with a chocolate, maybe the, the terroir of the chocolate, you know, kind of has, you know, flavors of banana and stuff like that. So we may use it as an ingredient, but just not the star. How do you think about desserts on the spectrum from sweet to savory? And um, I, I'm interesting, you were talking about umami. I'm interesting how you consider, you know, savory ingredients into like the creation of like a dessert. I think that those are the biggest things right now. I think with, um, you know, in the realm of things being fermented, different kojis um, inoculating with different things, using different homemade vinegars is a big one that really can help desserts a lot, like using kombucha techniques to like make a, make a tea, kind of like make a fermented tea and then use that to season things. I kind of think that's like the best, like I'm not into using bacon, you know, or like, you know, different meat products I'm not really into even vegetables outside of uh, a squash or a carrot like I, I really don't want to I'm not I'm just not a big fan of that kind of stuff what's your latest ingredient obsession the ingredient obsession yeah all flavors I I, I think it kind of is like vinegars like right now yeah and desserts I think we we use a lot of vinegar for brightness and and Again, to like kind of lower the sweetness of something like a lot of our dishes at 11 Madison too have some kind of element of surprise. So it'll look just like a, like a little ice cream, maybe like an ice cream sandwich on the plate. But then once you bite into it, there's going to be different layers of textures and maybe a liquid component that kind of spills out onto the plate. That liquid component, if it's an ice cream, needs to be frozen. And in order for that syrup to be able to be fluid, it needs to have a certain level of sugar to it. And again, it's going to make things pretty sweet. So we'll use a vinegar to brighten it up. Yeah, and kind of, yeah. So I always pick the brain of, of um, you know, the, the, the guests that I have on the show here, thinking about people that are at home and, you know, home cooks or foodies. I was thinking that maybe we can... Uh, Think of maybe like an apple pie because it's something which is like standard and um, that people can do at home. But how would you suggest a home cook to do it with, a, let's say, a Mark Welker twist on it? Mark Welker twist. Let's see here. I mean, what I would do is I would look at the apples first that I chose to make the pie. And, and like when I make an apple pie, I think of the different textures inside of the apple pie. And I don't like it to all be one texture. So I think that I would choose maybe three different varieties of apples. And I think that's where I would start. I would pick my favorite apples and you'd want an apple that's going to be very firm and hold up to cooking. You want one that's going to have different like sweetness or acidity notes as well. And you're going to want one that kind of falls apart and that can kind of like bind it all together. But again, not having like too much moisture, you know, and, and I think then there, there's different ways to deal with that. If an apple has too much moisture, what I would do is give it a little like sugar and like Calvados treatment or like pick like a, a liqueur of your choice. Rum could be bourbon, could be anything you really want it to be. But I would add a little bit of that to the apples and I would let them soak and macerate overnight. And then I would drain them, okay. you know, and then really kind of like get all that liquid out of it. And then maybe even make a caramel with all that juice and sugar that's left over and then kind of drizzle it on the inside. That's kind of where I would start. Not flambe, correct? You, you want flambe it? No, I would not. No, I probably no. wouldn't flambe okay. it. I would just like cook it. I mean, you could flambe it, but sure. I usually don't cook the apples um, too much before I go into a pie. And then just making a perfect crust. And I think it depends on the crust that you want, whether you want to add like a different fat to it or something like that. I know it's pretty big in some parts of the world to add like a cheese or something to an apple pie, but I've never really... Okay. What kind of cheese? Cheddar. cheddar. Oh, the cheddar. Yeah. Okay. Okay. I actually don't know where that came from, but yeah, cheddar, cheddar and apple pie is like, uh, it's a thing. 
Um, I would like to finish the um, the interview with a series of rapid fire questions. Go for it. That's okay yeah, for sure. you. Okay. So you and I are going into a little tasting tour here in Manhattan. So you see, you cannot select no man, no at Evan Madison Park. But where would we go, or where would you take me? Thinking about, of course, more you know on the sweet spectrum, like bakery, pastry, maybe bread. You know. It's it's a shame that this bakery just closed, arcade bakery just closed, and they had the laminated baguette. And that was my absolute favorite piece of bread that existed in New York City. I would love that. <laughs> love that, I'm sure. <laughs> uh, bread's Bakery, uh, the babka at Bread's Bakery is, is definitely really high up there on my list. I love uh, Levon cookies as well. The walnut chocolate chip cookie is pretty high on my list of, of things. What else? What else? Well... This is bakery focus, yes. Yeah, it yeah. is maybe a little off, off, off here a little bit. It could be ice cream too. I would I take mean, you to I B mean, and H Dairy on Second Avenue for a tuna melt, where they make their own challah on the inside. But it is absolutely fantastic, and we'd have a cup of uh, split pea soup. <laughs> okay, <laughs> with with this tuna melt made on their homemade challah. The challah is incredible. You can get their French toast. Very cool. Ice cream? Any? Oh, uh, Morgan Stearns is probably my favorite. I, I'm I'm so boring when it comes to ice cream. My favorite ice cream. I love vanilla ice creams, and they 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 tend to do like they would they would always. I don't know if they still do. They would have like three different vanillas, but the vanilla could be just maybe the vanilla bean that they use. But sometimes they would make a vanilla ice cream, but they would use maple sugar in it, and it wasn't a maple ice cream, but they just use maple sugar, and so it's just like a touch of maple. And I love that. I like the chocolate sorbet at Grom a lot. The, the gelato shop. So let's talk about vanilla a little bit. Obviously, it's the, the queen of spice, you know, for, for uh, dessert. But obviously, it's a very expensive spice, yes. especially recently with, you know, all the situations, you know, in, in Madagascar. And uh, so what kind of vanilla do you, do you like? Ah, and yeah, I'm there's something that you are we, into. We support a company that I'm actually quite passionate about. Um, it's called Hey Lala. They're, the company is based in New Zealand, but their vanilla is all grown in the kingdom of Tonga. And it's really, really incredible. They actually have a foundation that really helps the people of Tonga. And it started uh, a husband and wife team. And they, uh, like a cyclone came in and, and really destroyed the island. And they came in and they helped the island regrow and helped this company, like help these people start farming vanilla beans. And they're all hand pollinated and everything like that. They focus on women and helping the women of this island to harvest the vanilla. And it just so happens that the quality of the vanilla is superb. And it's actually reasonably priced compared to some of these other vanilla beans that are regarded as super high, you know, whether they come from Madagascar or vanilla or, you know, Tahiti and all these other places. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Interesting. The name again, you said? Hey Lala. Hey Lala. What's your favorite guilty pleasure sweet? My favorite guilty pleasure sweet would be sour Skittles. Okay. <laughs> yeah. So I, I, I could probably keep going here. Sour Skittles. I like a combination of plain M&Ms and Reese pieces. Uh huh. Mix those together. Peanut M&Ms are also pretty high on okay. that list. Okay, cool. Any kind of gummy candy. I, I like to go to Soccer Bit, the, uh -huh. the Swedish gummy yeah. store in the West Village. They have, uh, they would do like this little disc. It was half black licorice, half strawberry with a sour sugar on the wow. outside. Okay. Yeah, that was really good. Which is funny because I don't like sweet dessert so much, but like my, my guilty things are basically pure sugar with pure artificial sugar confectionery. Flavors. Okay. Citric acid. What are like the top three uh, cookbooks? So I would say maybe like maybe bakery book or pastry book or dessert book that inspired you the most. I would say Julia Child's baking. What is it called? On baking. I don't even remember that. Maybe it was just Julia's baking or something like that. That was a big one for me. Bo Freeberg's On Pastry Chef was the name of that book. Actually, that was, that was my book that they gave us in the first culinary school I went to. It is the book that I've, you look at it and it's literally, it's post-it notes. There's bookmarks. The book is just literally destroyed from <laughs> me cooking almost through that entire book. Okay. And it's all just like classic, like German and French, you know, style things. It's very outdated, but going back to being able to be creative now, you have to have a good foundation. Yeah. You know, and, and unless you understand these classic things and you know how to work with those, you know how to make, a series of different cookies or build a gingerbread house and all these things. Like, I just don't think that you're going to have it, you know, in a modern kitchen. So I think that's really important. Claudia Fleming's, you know, desserts from Gramercy Tavern okay. was also a big one. All of Charlie Trotter's books, Charlie Trotter desserts. That was really big 
for me that really opened my my mind as far as what what's possible with desserts and it was at a time when fusion cooking was you know was a thing and actually staged at charlie trotters for a week in in 2006 and that was another like mind opening experience for me so what frustrates you the most in the industry those things have has, has changed quite a bit. I would say I would say staffing is probably the most frustrating thing at this point in time. In you what know? way? Just again, like the the frustrations of of people not having the same work ethic and and mentality. Like not work ethic as in like not working poorly, but but the longevity of them. Like you know, people wanting wanting things faster and not wanting to work so long for for them to reach those goals. I hate when people leave when it's not their time to leave, you know, and again, I can't, I can't speak for someone what's, what's right or wrong for them, but I can speak as, as someone's chef that when I see potential in somebody and, and you really had higher hopes for them to grow within the company and to grow within your team or on, on the restaurant. And then they leave early to go, whatever, maybe, maybe they just found a sous chef title in some small restaurant in Brooklyn or whatever it may be. That can be frustrating. I've kind of gotten over the, you know, kitchen, dining room, like as, as a young hothead chef, you know, those, those kind of things frustrate you. But, you know, allergies and aversions from guests, I don't care. Like if someone wants to sub out vanilla ice cream for the milk ice cream on the milk and honey, like I'm more than happy to do that. You know, seven years ago, I probably would have like <laughs> really gotten under my skin. But, you know, I think hospitality and being hospitable and just making people happy is is more important than being an egotistical chef. Okay. What's your biggest pet peeves in the kitchen? Oh, wow. I think just not working clean. It's probably one of my biggest ones. Yeah. Like we like to, you know, working within a grid or 90 degree angles on your station. Like if someone's working on a station and, and they just look like a mess, like their, their phone or not their phone, but their knives are, are not like they're, they're at an angle or, or something like that. Like I want everything to be like lined up neat, dirty aprons or di having dirty towels on your side. Like I, I really can't stand that. You know, we have, I, I like everyone to be in uniform and I like, you know, it feels good to say everyone kind of look the same. Chef, thank you so much for being a, a guest, uh, you know, on the podcast. It was a great time. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Yeah, it, was, it was great talking with you. Thank you. Thank you so much for joining us this week on Flavors Unknown podcast. Make sure to visit our website, flavorsunknown.com, where you can find the show note of this episode and all other episodes that have been recorded previously. If I say Copa, Toro, Little Donkey, you could probably guess who will be on the show in two weeks. Okay, Boston, New York, Dubai. Yes, my guest in two weeks will be Chef Jamie Bissonnet, and I am super excited to have him on the show. If you want to ask questions to the chef, please send me an email at the following email address, contact at flavorsunknown.com. I see you in two weeks. And until then, remember that people who love to eat are always the best people. You've just enjoyed another delicious episode of Flavors Unknown. Hungry for more? Hit subscribe. Tell us where you're listening from by leaving a review. And for social media and show notes, head to flavorsunknown.com.